You've probably heard of Sam Barlow for his world-renowned, award-winning games, Her Story, and Telling Lies. What you probably didn't know is that he's based in New York with his own studio, Half Mermaid. Sam's here to share what TV and movies should learn from video games. NYC. I'm Sam Barlow. I'm the creator of Her Story and Telling Lies and the CEO of Half Mermaid Productions here in Brooklyn. I'm going to be taking up a little bit of your time talking about uh, this world we live in where there is uh, increasingly a convergence between video games, TV, movies, uh, and coming at this from the video game side of things, uh, I think uh, we usually have uh, more interesting ideas than is often the case uh, coming from the other direction. Uh, I think there's some interesting things that we've learned making video games and telling stories through video games that um, I think are ripe for uh, being utilized uh, in these more traditional linear mediums. Uh, so uh, the title of my talk is The Death of the Container, What TV and Movies Should Learn from Video Games. Uh, I think the context for all this is to look back at the 20th century and understand that the 20th century was essentially uh, all about broadcast storytelling. Uh, so, you know, coming off the printing press where you can write a story and have this duplicated hundreds, thousands, millions of times and distributed so that people all around the world can read this same story. And this becomes radio, this becomes television, uh, this is movies. And really kind of for me what defines this moment in storytelling is the ability for someone to reach an audience at scale. Uh, so if you think, uh, you know, the height of television, the height of movies, the height of radio, uh, a single story could touch millions and millions of people. And you had these kind of cultural moments around them. Uh, now, by necessity, for that 20th century broadcast tech to work, you have a very fixed static story. Uh, before something can be shown in movie theaters, you need to have your movie finished and edited and put on a reel of film, put in a can, put in a truck, and it is driven physically to the cinema where it's going to be played. Uh, for television, in order to take this television signal and zap it into everybody's TV sets, everybody is receiving the same signal. This, this, this single broadcast originates and then is transmitted to everybody else. So you have this ability to tell a story at great scale, but the story itself uh, is essentially fixed and uh, uniform. And there are some small amounts of reactivity uh, in these examples uh, you know going back to the printing press you know when someone like Dickens was publishing his stories they were published in volumes you had this episodic element and he was able to react to his audience uh, in some cases actually uh, editing and changing endings uh, which is something that you know is, is still a big thing today uh, amongst fan bases um, so you you know you have these very small moments where authors can react to the audience, but essentially you have these fixed stories that are then distributed at scale. Uh, and, you know, pre previously, prior to that, uh, the traditions of storytelling, when you think about like uh, traditions of oral storytelling, uh, even kind of theatrical performances, stories tended to be told more locally and there was room for individual variation. There was room for in the moment kind of dynamism in terms of how the storyteller reacts to the audience that they're addressing. So how are games, specifically modern games, different to this kind of 20th century broadcast model of storytelling? Well, the modern video game is digitally native. Uh, it exists uh, on a computer in the cloud in this digital space and uh, most video games are essentially unbounded you know a given movie is going to be 93 minutes no matter how you, you, where you watch it it's going to be 93 minutes uh, a tv show traditionally was a 30 minute show or a 60 minute show and uh, if you're on network tv you had ad breaks at these specific points very structured and controlled whereas a video game 
uh, you know, there are websites that will tell you this is the average time a specific video game will take, but essentially video games uh, fill people's time. Uh, they can expand based on how much time you have. Uh, there are, uh, especially in the mobile space, video games that have these very small uh, little play sessions, which inevitably then stack up and people find themselves accruing uh, tens of hours of Candy Crush in, in these small kind of uh, 30 second minute kind of play sessions. Uh, a big difference for me with a video game is uh, nothing happens unless the player is present. Um, and you know, this, trivially this is true of a TV. Someone needs to turn the TV on and press play, but for a video game to work every second, uh, you need this constant input from the player. You need a kind of continual back and forth with the player for the thing to exist, for it to actually, uh, you know, meaningfully play out, uh, which I think is, is quite a unique thing. Um, most video games uh, uniquely versus other media uh, can give you challenge. Um, you know, there are obstacles to progression which require an effort. Uh, whether that's just like a time sink or whether that's an actual kind of uh, intellectual challenge. Uh, video games have a large capacity for expression. Uh, you know, watching a TV show, who I am matters because of how I experience the TV show, but externally, uh, other than shouting at the screen, I'm not watching this show in a way that allows me to express something about myself. Uh, most video games, facilitate this, whether it's just, you know, how I'm choosing to run and jump through a Mario level to more specific expression in terms of, uh, you know, games that allow you to be creative or games that allow you to customize your character's appearance. Um, and then video games are wonderful when it comes to exploration. Uh, and again, like traditional linear media, I sit and the experience washes over me. I open a book at page one and I keep turning until I get to the final page. With video games, uh, a way of dealing with this unboundedness of the, the, the sheer amount of content is to give players choice about how they explore it. And that kind of metaphor of, of exploration, I think, is key to the experience of video games, uh, is making many, many small choices about how we actually move through these experiences. Um, and with that comes the thrill of discovery. Uh, comes the anticipation of discovery, uh, all the things that make exploration pleasurable. Uh, and I think there's, there's one other thing as well that I would say is intrinsic uh, to the modern video game, which is simulation. Uh, but in the games I've been making uh, and kind of in, in how I relate video games to what television and film can become, I kind of cross out simulation, which I think was one of the more contentious things when I made Her Story was, I think at that point in time and traditionally we think that what makes video games unique as a medium is this systemic element, is the simulation, is our ability to model physics, model NPC behavior, um, and that a lot of how we express ourselves through video games is through creating systems and having the player kind of uh, figure those systems out. Uh, but for me, um, I've kind of been interested to see what happens if you throw out a lot of the systemic element, um, this idea of a simulation. Uh, and I think this is something you see elsewhere. So you look at a game like Gone Home, a game like Disco Elysium. Uh, these are good examples of games that come from a tradition which has a lot of system systemic elements. Uh, so the immersive sim in the case of Gone Home, uh, you know, it's traditionally a, a game with lots of combat, uh, lots of kind of challenges through which there are kind of systemic solutions. There are lots of interesting uh, ecosystems or various physical simulations taking place. And what Gone Home did was kind of throw a lot of that out and say, well, if, if we throw out the combat, if we throw out a lot of these other challenges which make use of the simulation, and we're left with just being present in a 3D space and consuming various pieces of story content. Like, what does that game look like? Uh, you know, Disco Elysium, uh, there are still lots of systems running there, but they've removed a lot of the other systems. And so to play Disco Elysium, for me, it, 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 I spend a lot of time staring into space, wondering about 
what you know how far can we take this kind of subtractive game design because you know disco elysium is a series of pieces of interactive fiction a series of little story vignettes and the geography and the space of it kind of serves almost like a memory palace in that it's this it's this spatial way of organizing this information um, and you know you can kind of imagine taking that to the nth degree and eliminating the space and the geography uh, and just being left with these kind of text vignettes and sort of wondering what that looks like um, but i think these are all useful examples of where to tell a story in a video game space we're looking at what are the cool verbs that are really interesting in video games uh, what happens if we throw out some of the verbs that otherwise are a given but but feel extraneous uh and and so we're pushing towards we still we still have this challenge this expression this exploration but some of those simulation elements kind of uh are kind of pushed down um so that's kind of where video games sit in my mind and we have that 20th century history of tv and film um, so what's happened in the 21st century with tv and film well, everything's gone digital, uh, everything is streaming, uh, we have smart TVs. Uh, what has that done? Well, it's slowly started to change the shape of what we watch. Um, what even is TV versus a movie anymore? What is a limited series? What is a TV movie versus a theatrical movie? Um, we have 30 minute dramas now. We have TV shows that are 28 minutes, 29, 32 minutes long. You know, we're slowly able to escape some of those very specific constraints that you had from say network TV. Um, the way we consume things has changed. Uh, the operable verb now is to binge. Uh, you know, it used to be that you would sit and watch TV and there were certain time slots uh, when you could watch the show you wanted to watch. Now we could binge. Uh, and binging feels very similar to how we might talk about gaming sessions. You know, I'm just going to sit and play 10 hours of Zelda. Or, you know, people talk similarly in, in terms of kind of negative behavior, in terms of video games being addictive and people losing themselves in them. Uh, and, you know, binging has kind of similar connotations. So we have this, we've changed the way at a kind of high level that we consume these things. Uh, personalization has become a bigger deal uh, at the level of the shelf, right? It, it, it used to be that you wanted to take out a video, you would go into a video store and there would be a shelf and there may be some genres and ways that the shelves were organized uh, or you could go and speak to someone behind the counter. Now uh, a Netflix functions as this humongous warehouse of, of shows uh, and they attempt to personalize that and serve up things that you might be interested in based on their algorithmic magic or what have you um, and then you have aspects of that like the personalized thumbnail so when i log into netflix the thumbnail i get for the godfather might be different to the thumbnail you get to the godfather uh, and in theory these uh, thumbnails are being customized based on my preferences to make shows more appealing to me make it more likely that i'm going to click and watch a show uh, that I might, you know, shows that Netflix thinks are super interesting to me. Um, they want to get me in there watching the show. So they're going to tweak those thumbnails to make these things appeal to me. So that's kind of probably as far as these things have gone. Um, but ultimately, TV and movies are kind of still the same. Uh, they are still conceived of and filmed as linear chunks of story arranged in a linear order. Uh, and everybody who watches gets exactly the same show, uh, you know, just as if it had been put on a piece of film, put in a can and driven to you, your front door. Uh, we just have faster trucks now. Uh, so, you know, fundamentally the form has not changed. The way in which we consume it and discover it, uh, you know, there are some slight tweaks to the shape uh, of the container, but essentially TV and film is the same thing. Uh, and a good example for me of why this feels like there is, there is this big uh, room for TV and film to change and transform more drastically. Uh, a good example for me is Quibi. So Quibi came out earlier this year, uh, was, was generally not seen as a huge success. Uh, but if you look at Quibi, I think, uh, so Jeffrey Katzenberg 
uh, businessman uh, makes a good observation. He looks around and he sees that people are embracing short form, that uh, people are spending more time on their smartphones, that a younger generation is mixing up their social media, their video gaming, their TV consumption. Uh, and it's you know, a very different world to the, the kind of network TV world that, that everyone in the industry kind of knows and understands. So he, he sees this thing is happening. He sees that devices and digital are changing how we consume. Um, but Quibi didn't really do anything transformative with it. Uh, they essentially, as far as it seems, took existing screenplays that people had lying around and then just chopped them up into smaller chunks, uh, served them up in a, essentially a standard video player. Um, and people rightfully said, like, how is this different to just watching something on Netflix and pausing, like after 10 minutes? Uh, you know, users still have a single choice, which is to keep watching or to not keep watching. Uh, do I binge this show or do I stop binging this show? Like that's still your relationship with the media. Um, and they also uh, fail to engage with the kind of social aspects, which is a sort of side point. But, you know, trying to address this audience that is consuming television in a different way and, and often consuming it publicly, uh, in, a, in a kind of social context, um, you know, it was very hard when they launched for people to actually meaningfully share what they were doing or screenshot or kind of tweet about the shows they're watching. So that kind of spoke to some of their misunderstanding of perhaps what could be done. Um, compare this with the games that I've been working on, um, which, you know, exist within the world of video games, but we're tackling the same thing of like, how do I tell a rich long form story through someone's phone or other kind of gaming device um, you know and her story and telling lies are on some level unbounded um, you know how long does it take to play her story or telling lies i can give you an average number some people might take this long others might spend 10 times as long a given session with her story or telling lies can expand to fill the time you have and often uh, like music to my ears is people that sit down to play for five minutes, see what this thing is, and, and you know, three hours later, look up, and they've just been totally immersed in it. Um, in watching the content within Her Story and Telling Lies, the player has more choices. Uh, chopping these things up into small chunks as the, the story is kind of uh, presented to you in these games means that there is this higher frequency of players getting to make a decision uh you know there are multiple clips they can go watch they've they've seen one thing and they now have three or four ideas for where to go next threads to follow in this story um, and that might be making leaps to discover new things it might be going back and re-watching things in a new context uh you know they they have lots and lots of options and as they're watching the content they're thinking about this element of interactivity. They're thinking about what they want to do next. They're kind of noticing uh, some of the subtext and things that are going on in a given clip. Um, especially with Telling Lies, we try to rework your relationship with the footage itself. Um, you know, traditionally you sit back and TV or film is thrown at you 24 frames a second. And, and then it stops and you walk out of the theater or you go get up and get a snack if you're watching TV. Uh, in digital, there's no reason why people can't stop, rewind, why they can't scrub slowly. If there's a moment where something is happening in a character's face, let them rewind and bask in that kind of remixing the experience as they go, giving them that control. Like I think there is intrinsically something interesting about that. Um, and, and really, the ethos of both of these stories is to acknowledge the audience's participation and give some of the creativity to them. So both of these games tell stories where there are larger gaps. A lot of the story is told in the kind of invisible space, uh, the negative space around the bits and pieces of story. Um, so we're acknowledging that the user is participating in creating this story. The story is happening in their heads. Um, and we lean into the fact that we have this audience that is aware of tropes, that we have this audience that is so exposed to storytelling 
um, is, is so radically educated in the tropes of storytelling at this point because they're saturated with media day in, day out that we can actually hand over some of the, the, the work of doing the storytelling to them by leaving bigger gaps, by building more of this on the subtext, by uh, not presenting every single piece of the story to them bit by bit as you would traditionally. Um, that, that is something that the player can do and, and kind of acknowledges that there is a level of interactivity and subjectivity and immersion that we bring to everything now. Um, this is just how we consume information. Um, we are just kind of more active, whether it's scrolling through our social media, clicking, following links, going down a rabbit hole, Googling things, pulling up multiple tabs. Like naturally, we don't just sit and allow ourselves to be broadcasted to. We are kind of more active and a lot is happening in our brains. So both these games really embrace that as part of their construction. Um, and I think there's, intrinsic to both these games uh, and, and both of them are essentially static stories um, you know they, they do not branch they do not have multiple kind of narrative twists and turns that depend on what the player's done but by their very nature different people will see different bits of content and not only that but the order in which they see these things the the leaps of logic that has taken them from clip a to clip b that is essentially the story like that is how they experience the story. So everyone has a subjective personal experience. And I think that ties into this idea of, of expression in video games. Um, you know, watching traditional television now becomes an expressive act when people take to social media and share their thoughts. Uh, and you, you know, you consume uh, kind of recaps uh, read what different people thought of something, hit, hit up the kind of the Reddit hive minds to deconstruct what happened in your latest episode of your favorite TV show. Like that kind of personal experience, that lens through which we now see these pieces of storytelling, um, for me, like the next leap is to acknowledge that and make that part of the experience. And I think that's very much a, a core part of how we construct our story and telling lies. Um, so, you know, both of these games for me are looking at how we tell stories, looking at what it means to have an engaged, interactive audience, um, looking at what it means to have an audience that is super educated in the traditions of storytelling, um, and then kind of bring them into the creative act to some extent. Um, and, and really for me, this is thinking about what video games do the heart of this is exploration, really is digging into what it means to explore. I mean, if you imagine um, a, a digital newspaper, right? You go to a, a newspaper site now, imagine if that digital newspaper just gave you a page of stories and then you press the button, it turns to the next page. You press the button, it turns to the next page. That, that isn't how it works. Digital newspapers are now part of the web. The web is how we most commonly now organize information and you explore. Like that is how you, you explore the, the, the internet. Uh, there is all this information, more information you could possibly consume and you explore and you follow threads. That really is now how we are kind of conditioned to consume information. And stories are essentially information that's kind of combined with emotion. Um, so really in thinking like, what does a digital version of a story look like? What does an interactive version of a story look like? It's coming at it from that angle for me. Um, and I think that, you know, video games understand that when you have a wealth of content, you end up leaning on the player and you end up leaning on verbs that revolve around exploration because that, that creates this meaningful uh, movement through all this information for a given player. Even action oriented video games now are becoming more exploratory. Uh, you know, the template of the open world video game has essentially been imposed on most genres. One thing that I think has often been a distraction when we think about interactive TV and, and kind of this convergence between games and movies um, is like getting hung up on choose your own adventure, uh, which is an attempt to give the impression of a system of cause and effect uh, within uh, these more traditional media pieces, you know, chunks of storytelling, 
uh, with choices that give this illusion that there is some systemic logic running, that there is some reality simulation happening. Um, and, and Choose Your Own Adventure is often sold on this idea that you can see the different ways a story could go, uh, that you can kind of play around in those possibilities. But I think this is to misunderstand what audiences enjoy with storytelling. Audiences crave the ability to go deeper into their stories, not necessarily broader. Um, you know, you hear TV execs talking about stickiness. Oh, mobile video games are really sticky. If only we could have that stickiness in our television. Um, and, and they're often thinking in terms of this idea of, oh, we'll have a show and people will replay it nine times because they want to see the different options. And for me, that's looking in the wrong place. Like you should be asking, how do we let audiences go nine times deeper into the story? Um, because that's what people do when they dig into a, a traditional video game or they really dig into an exploratory video game. It's the sensation of going deeper into the world um, rather than the, this kind of aspect of repetition. Um, and you know, this for me, it's crystallized if you think like the audience cares less about what if X did this instead. They're much more interested in why did X do this? Like the emotion in a piece of storytelling comes from a specific choice. Uh, and we can give people the ability to kind of bask in that choice, to view it from different angles, to kind of understand it uh, and dig into it more deeply um, rather than like throw that choice away or make it redundant or kind of multiply it out. Um, you know, so for me, understanding that stories in which things happen that have specific moments, understanding what generates the emotion in a story uh, and how do we let people dig into that deeper for me is the opportunity. Um, you know, when somebody rewatches their favorite movie, that is interesting to them, not because they're just reliving exactly the same experience. The, the act of repetition is not interesting. It's coming to those emotional moments with added context. Understanding the story better makes the emotion of those moments kind of land more heavily, gives you a deeper understanding of the characters. And for me, that is this interesting opportunity with how we kind of tackle uh, storytelling. Um, so ultimately, for me, the opportunity is this, the container. So, you know, we've come from this era of storytelling in which stories are told in containers um, and they were different size and shape containers. Uh, and there were a couple that were very popular and we've moved into the digital world and the interactive world. And that doesn't mean doing what Quibi did, which is to just come up with smaller different containers. For me, it's to fully acknowledge the container is dead. If you get rid of the container, what happens now? Um, and for me, the next step is to embrace what it means to tell a story without a container, um, which you know is thinking about exploration. Stories are pieces of information. How do we explore that information? How do we explore a rich full world of this story um, in a way that pulls the player into it. Um, you know, the player becomes the person who's driving the exploration of this story is their own curiosity, their own interests, their own biases is leading them a certain direction. Um, you know, that role shifts to the player from the traditional curator, whether that's, you know, a director picking shot, 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 and very specifically telling a story. Um, that is being handed over somewhat to the player, um, that role. Um, so you've really got to think about this. You're not giving someone a neatly wrapped piece of finished story content. You're kind of dropping the audience into the middle of your story. Uh, and what does your story look like when people are dropped into the middle of it? Uh, what is interesting about your story uh, if you ask the player to kind of lead the way through it? Um, for me, that is what it means to exist in a kind of post-container world of storytelling. And I'll finish on my favorite example um, or analogy, which is uh, that of lemon meringue pie. So I, I see the audience for storytelling uh, in the same way that my, to my relationship with lemon meringue pie. So that is my favorite dessert. I love a good lemon meringue pie. Uh, I have eaten a lot of lemon meringue pie in the same way that we have an audience that is so saturated with storytelling and just the amount of content 
um, you know, the audience has eaten a lot of lemon meringue pie. They're binging it. Uh, and, you know, binging works in the context of food. Uh, if I go into a diner and order three lemon meringue pies, uh, at some point, I can't even taste what I'm eating. Um, and to be honest, I've eaten so many lemon meringue pies that to sit down and eat one, I can be almost done with my slice of pie before I even notice that, you know, I'm processing it. Like, am I actually tasting this pie or am I just remembering what pie tastes like? Like it's become uh, more of a rote action. Uh, I've kind of lost that connection to the joy of eating lemon meringue pie. So what does a chef do in that case? If you go to a fancy restaurant, uh, you're gonna pay five times as much for a deconstructed lemon meringue pie as you would for that traditional diner pie. Um, but what happens now is the chef brings out this deconstructed lemon meringue pie. Um, the chef is not giving you mini lemon meringue pies. He's not changing the just the shape of it or the means by which you consume it. He's actually deconstructing the pie. And now when I have this deconstructed pie and as the person eating it, I'm picking up a little bit of the lemony stuff and a little bit of crispy meringue or what have you and some of this uh, crumb dust or whatever I am re-understanding what it is to eat a lemon meringue pie um, I am in closer proximity to the ingredients to what it means to assemble this dessert um, and in that moment when I'm having this deconstructed lemon meringue pie I am experiencing uh, what it means to eat this dessert uh, in a way that is fresh and new again. Uh, and for me, this really is the opportunity with uh, the 21st century of television and film is to look at this audience that is, uh, you know, this information overload generation that is so saturated, has so much content to choose from, has seen everything, to use the tools that come from video games to focus on exploration, on expressivity, um, to break your storytelling down and understand that exploration of the story is what is most interesting. Uh, the ability to make the story subjective and actually to situate the whole story around that of the viewer. Understand them as a participant in this act. Um, for me, that is is what it will take to uh, take an audience that is, is binging lemon meringue pie and has forgotten how exciting it tastes um, and give them this fresh deconstructed dessert which is alive and exciting again. Uh, now I'm going to go and eat some lunch because I feel hungry. Thank you for listening uh, and enjoy the rest of Play NYC.